I'd like to thank everybody, especially Caroline Reichenberg, who actually uh, suggested that you guys invite me to speak at some point. And here we are. Hot day, good day to be gardening early in the morning and then uh, watching this this afternoon. So for those of you that haven't had a chance to get to your garden, uh, we went there last weekend and uh, wandered around a bit, took a few photographs and uh, took some of my tools over to show you what could have happened in the garden back in the 1800s in terms of pruning uh, gentlemen's working canes and overall the cutting garden. So this afternoon, I'd like to, so it's a long history, but I think a good one. And it's something that's actually coming back. A lot of uh, uh, younger students that we work with in schools in New York City and about are back into loving gardening. We do a lot of green roof work and outdoor classrooms in New York City. So uh, these tools are invaluable um, and have been over the centuries. A lot of people think gardening tools are hand forks, shovels, small spades, and that, and it goes well beyond. It's pretty, uh, pretty amazing, actually, what I've been able to turn up over the last 15 to 20 years. You'll see uh, this collage, you know, just many, 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 many different kinds of tools that we'll discuss uh, a little more um, personally in a couple of minutes. And I think that we go way back. In fact, we can go back about 3.3 million years ago where stones were actually discovered in Kenya uh, from that period that were used early on. But as we know it, the uh, Stone Age from uh, 1.65 million years to go to about 10,000 BC, mostly the tools were from animals. and They came from um, the mastodons and other critters that might have roamed uh, the earth at that point in time. But uh, the earth was being cultivated and this is how oftentimes it was done. More recently in the pre-dynastic period, uh, the Egyptians actually fashioned tools out of wood and uh, by tying, um, you know, V-shaped branches together and they would create dibbers and hoes and the like to uh, furrow the earth and sow seeds. A little closer at the Stone Age uh, period, now we start having things that look more like tools. Stones were actually honed along with wood uh, to be used uh, in the fields and to grow food for the uh, current civilization at that time. And then we get up into the classical age where taking the wheelbarrow, for example, uh, the Chinese developed the wheelbarrow in the uh, second century BC. And as you can see, they haven't changed a lot today. I have uh, not many, but I have a number of wheelbarrows in the collection uh, and some for children because I don't have a, a lot of room for the larger ones, but uh, they're fascinating and the overall structures uh, again, date back, you know, very many uh, centuries ago. We get through the Middle Ages tools then when we were starting to forge metals. Um, I think that a lot of the tools really were weapons in those days. Uh, you'll see down the line with some of my collection, these don't happen to be in my collection, but the ones that I have, the mistletoe cutters and that are very reminiscent of the weapons the knights used back in the 14 and 1500s. And moving up to the Renaissance, we had uh, tools becoming more sophisticated, the use of wood and metal together, um, you know, brought on newer and broader based tools for society. And then of course the pre-industrial revolution, it, it's great because even in England today, many of the small towns still have blacksmiths. So you can go, and have tools made to fit your hand, your arm length, your body type, your weight. Um, so we don't have that in this country anymore, but it still does exist in some local areas. The, again, the pre-industrial revolution, 
These are mostly French tools in my collection. So they were multifunctional. You could hack, slash, hammer, uh, twist, and turn with these tools. They were used in the fields. They were used to um, create uh, gardens and maintain um, the aristocratic gardens uh, that we can still visit today. And then the Industrial Revolution came along and things started to be made in, in greater quantities and that persists today. The early plant hunters uh, carried tools. They uh, predominantly would go out on the ships. They would take uh, vasculums that you see in the uh, upper right. They'd always have a fern trowel and a leather sheath. And when they returned to the ships, they would actually plant the seedlings that they discovered in Wardian cases. And of course they were um, on the sea for many, many months, sometimes years. And uh, these plant collectors became famous and they were uh, you know, well sought after by the uh, kings and queens. The kings and queens funded their voyages and uh, actually reaped the benefits uh, as, when they returned. And again, uh, you'll look, I stay away from farm tools, but farming and farm implements were, are, were huge in the post-industrial revolution um, and power tools today. I have a series of tools that were actually electrified back in the 40s and the 50s. Today, they went to gas power, and now we're actually going back to battery powered tools because they're cleaner and they're quieter. The uh, social context of gardening in the 20th century, it's pretty interesting because you're doing things on the uh, suffrage movement. Uh, women actually had ergonometrically designed tools before you had the boat. Uh, World War I brought on a movement to create farming. Uh, rural women brought city women out to the rural areas to create farms and grow food during wartime. And I think that for me, oftentimes I marvel that a lot of the tools that I've been able to find that are two and 300 years old are still here because during the wars, the world wars, um, everything metal was being collected. So whether it was old car parts or whatever, but tools were also taken from people and melted down to make munitions. So. Um, I've been lucky enough to find many of these tools and save them, along with others around the world. But I think uh, it, it creates uh, some, some great memories as to how these tools, you know, were used over the centuries and how many people they fed, how many lives they saved. Again, with women in the garden, uh, the little gripper uh, was, was used. Uh, they had many ways to gather uh, flowers as they went through the gardens in formal dress. They had wonderful trugs, trugs on canes. Um, so it was the well thought out um, in the day. There were also uh, lawn rollers that women could use. The Sandringham roller was used primarily for lawn bowling courts. And actually I'm lucky enough to have one of these rollers, but it, they were developed for the King and Queen of England in the Sandringham Gardens originally. Children's tools prevail. Many, many children's tools made again in the 1800s. We have them today. I would say they're not as prevalent today, but of course children and women can use pretty much the same size tools. But a wide array, hand forks. They even had little um, scissors. They had small pruning shears. They had, of course, watering cans, they had wheelbarrows, and so they could fully man a garden and help the family grow food. Victory Gardens came into play. Interestingly enough, what we go through today, George Washington Carver was probably the most famous agricultural scientist. He was also a black gentleman that uh, made many, many uh, helpful discoveries uh, during his time. 
as I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of schools, we do a lot of outdoor classrooms, we work a lot on green roofs, and uh, children today are getting this in their curriculum. They're growing food, they're working with their culinary staffs in the kitchens of their schools to create new recipes. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, we haven't lost it all, and I think in the, in the last uh, six months of the COVID-19, it's become even more important and we're finding people coming out of the city, coming up into Dutchess and Columbia County, of course, other areas throughout New York State and the, and the tri-state region. But I think people are reacquainting with the earth and finding out how much fun it is and how productive and safe it can be. There's an abundance of tools today. I wouldn't say they're as good a quality. You can pay um, you know, quite a bit of money, uh, but Tools are enduring and can last if they're taken care of. So there's a tool for every task and a task for every tool. I think that, again, I try to stay away from agricultural tools, but the shovel you see on the left is probably a grain shovel, but could be used for mulch in the garden as well. But a series of many different sizes and shapes of hand forks, there were hoes to furrow with, to seed and to weed. There were ditching spades because many of the gardens were irrigated through channels uh, that were created off of rivers. There were breast plows used and it's amazing how many different types of handles and heads were, were developed and tried throughout uh, the history of gardening. Again, the uh, ability to buy good quality tools today is here. Uh, you have to seek them out, but again, a little more expensive, but I think worth having and worth taking care of if you're a long-term gardener. In the early days of pruning, there were slashers, there were bill hooks, there were long handles, short handle tools, and it was all done by hand. And I think that uh, back in the 1700s, you'll see that a lot of the French tools that were developed, they used a heart shape to designate that they were from France. And I think that uh, many of these tools are one of a kind, very heavy. If anybody wants to come and visit the gallery in Wasaic, you're more than welcome. But all these tools, again, have been fashioned out of steel, made by a local blacksmith, had amazing wood handles. Some have been replaced over the years, but many are original. Then they went to a multi-cutting head shear. So these shears uh, were a little faster, a little more uh, easy to use because they had flat backs on them. So as you're pruning a hedge, you could run that hedge uh, or run the uh, uh, multi-cutting shear along the face of the hedge as you were cutting to get a very uniform cut. And of course, today with mechanization, makes it much easier to prune some of these large hedges you'll find in particular on the British Isles and the European continent. Loppers for branch cutting, uh, no chainsaws in these days so that uh, Again, many mechanized, hand mechanized loppers were tried. There were, uh, you know, instead of springs, metal rods were used. You know, you had a parrot uh, shape uh, cutter. Uh, many, many different types of mechanization was used in order to uh, do the necessary branch cutting. Today, different story. We even have ratcheted uh, branch cutters makes it much easier, uh, for, especially for women or younger uh, gardeners to use. Um, and we go to the pruning shears where, again, everybody, hopefully everybody has a good pruning shear if you're a gardener, but pruning shears weren't developed until the 1820s by a French gentleman uh, in order to better prune his grapevines. And uh, again, many, many, many different types of shears have been developed and tried over the centuries, uh, but they pretty much remain unchanged. If you look at a Felco, for example, 
you know, they look very similar to many of the shares that you see here. And again, shares of today, you look back to the prototypes from the 1800s and they're all very, very similar. There were also a multitude of knives that were used, uh, one to prune your grapevines, but also to graft with, to do minor pruning in the garden, do cutting of flowers, deadheading, and of course, um, promoting growth with vegetable vines. The bill hooks that you see here uh, were some of the early slashers. Uh, you could also hit with this edge to pound. So again, quite multifunctional tools. Asparagus knives, a lot of people don't realize the Europeans, the French in particular, would never eat the green. They would make soup out of the green asparagus and they would only eat the white below the crown. So the French love to have the serrated uh, asparagus knives. The British developed the gouge type that you would insert in the ground and cut underneath, pull out and able to get the white. And of course the white is actually cultivated and grown today, although we don't find it that often. Onion hose and cabbage, strawberry spades, uh, the strawberry spades obviously have larger plants, larger um, hoes needed, and spades. The onion hose made many different head types on the hose, different curvatures to see what ergometrically was going to work better. But you could use these to weed, you could use, use these to furrow, and of course set your onion plants. Divers. Wide range of dibbers. There were kind of more agricultural dibbers. You could walk along in a field. Um, there were multi headed dibbers, but the larger dibbers were used for corn, seed, and all the larger um, seeded plants. And then you'd have, again, one of a kind. This is actually from Grimsthorpe Castle in England that I got that was used by the royal family. And you had personal dibbers that were used in the garden of many different types, sizes. And of course, you could even take pieces of wood. If you wanted longevity, you'd have the local blacksmith fashion a metal tip. And then this is one of my favorites, the working canes. Gentlemen could take a walk. They could practice their golf swing while getting rid of dandelions. They could root out weeds. They could dig out weeds, they could hook and pull weeds, they could uh, poke weeds out of the ground. But I have some that actually have bow saws that come out uh, and the like. So uh, amazing um, what a gentleman can do on a walk. Fruit pickers, uh, again, wider range of fruit pickers, long handled, short handled, basket type. Uh, the metal type had very sharp edges and you'd hook the stem of the fruit and you'd twist and the fruit would drop in to the receptacle and you'd lower it and put it in your basket. Uh, there were uh, shoulder uh, pack baskets that were used as well as baskets on the ground. Um, also the, the French in particular had beautiful orchard ladders uh, that were used to pick the fruits. And of course Today, it's a bigger deal. Uh, you know, it's not one or two fruit trees. There are acres and acres and acres. So there have been some pretty interesting prototypes developed, you know, to make uh, apple picking and fruit picking, you know, much more manageable and efficient and effective, less lowering the cost. To get your garden going a little bit earlier, there were cloches, mostly glass, but also terracotta. The taller ones were for things like rhubarb, so that in the early uh, uh, parts of spring, uh, frost didn't destroy the plant. You can see the only problem with this is they do heat up. So you had to go out in the morning and lift each cloche and usually put a shard of terracotta pot underneath to get air ventilation. And many of these cloches had tops that were removable so you could ventilate through the top of the cloche to save your plants. 
And I think one of the all time favorites, cucumber straighteners, hard to believe, but once the vine started growing, you'd feed the vine into the tube that was hanging um, in a greenhouse or in a garden. The cucumber would develop in straight fashion. You could clip it and obviously uh, remove it from the, uh, the straightener. But these were developed because in the, uh, I think, late 1700s, 1800s, when things were shipped by crate on boats, they had to be manageable. And the more curve, the less you could put in a crate. So there, there still are laws now that uh, talk about the maximum curvature any fruit or vegetable can have. Watering cans, um, again, one of my all time favorites. I've been able to collect now close to 700 in the collection. And um, many cans that we're gonna see are French. These are all uh, French cans, solid copper, copper, brass, and tin, solid brass. Um, simply amazing. I, I thought I would never get one and now I've been lucky enough to find uh, many more than that. I was fortunate a couple of years ago, I was asked by the Metropolitan Museum to participate in a show um, on 19th century French open space and gardens. So I had one case uh, filled with these watering cans and another case filled with uh, assorted other implements from the uh, 19th century. Watering cans today, unfortunately, a lot of plastic. Even Hawes has a plastic version, which I actually bought up at the Coastal Maine Botanical Garden to put in the collection just to show where we've gone, where we've come from, where we've come to at this point. But there's still, still some pretty good cans available, but they're not made like the old ones and they won't be around uh, nearly as long. Lawn sprinklers and hose reels. I have a good friend, a uh, retired judge in New York that only collects lawn sprinklers. And he's got about 600 out at his house in Watermill, um, on, many on display. He usually has a party every summer with family and they rate uh, 10 sprinklers as, and pick a winner. So you can have fun. Uh, the Pluviates, uh, British made, they had, uh, they tried again, a single um, sprinkler. They tried a double and they tried smaller ones for smaller spaces. Uh, there was reputed to be a, a third type, fourth type actually with three wheels, but nobody's ever been able to find one. But I have uh, lucky enough to have all three um, in the collection. And today, um, these little tractor guys were um, developed back in the 50s and run through, but there's a wider range. Uh, these sprinkler types now you probably found to be more available. Sometimes the tripods for larger lawn areas are used as well. Pluviometers or rain gauges and thermometers were big in the gardens. Um, people actually actively plotted how much rain uh, was received any given time during any given month, during any given year, so records were kept. Um, seed sowers, uh, I showed you the divers, which were used for larger seeds, um, in seed beds, in greenhouses, um, you had multiple action spring-loaded seed divers, you had seed spoons to um, actually quantify uh, various seeds. You had, you know, handmade, one of a kind, wooden seed um, sowers, and of course, many plastic and metal versions as well. Capturing critters. Critters are always a problem in the gardens. There were mole spades, there were molars. You'd stick these in the lawn, so trap the mole, and then you could dig it out. And uh, this has a pointed end, so you could actually kill them all. One of my favorites is the hedgehog tongs, where you could go out in the garden and you could actually pick up the hedgehog. And I always say, take it down to the next uh, property because I would never want to kill one, but you could um, easily 
transport them someplace else. I also have quite a few mouse traps, wasp traps that were put in trees with poison. So a lot of different ways to catch critters were developed. Pest and fertilizer, um, multitude of different sprayers. Um, I was just able to buy a collection of 100 sprayers in England um, with great diversity. I hit the jackpot over the last year with turn of the century French copper sprayers. Um, but you'll find in the uh, initial days, the old days, late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, you had beautiful containers made mostly from brass. Um, now, of course, we get plastic. And then kind of assorted gardening uh, accessories, beautiful trugs. We had boots, we had kneelers, we had garden hammers specifically made, of course, beautiful plant markets. We had uh, sifters um, that could be used that graded out, you know, various uh, different stones uh, in your soil. gardening medals, gardening awards, and gardening um, in, in general was, uh, you know, something that was a very um, well-acclaimed feat for most of the uh, larger gardens and garden shows in, in Europe. And I wish we could bring these back because I think it means a lot to people. You know, if you're given awards, if you're given a medal, if you're given a cup, and we do that in the county fairs to a point, but I think a lot of our gardens and that stuff that we have today would uh, be wise to do this and could be a good fundraiser as well. And then we get to lawns. Lawns, uh, I think, are an obsession with too many people. I think that uh, the perfect lawn has been sought. Some people buy seven applications a year to have their lawn sprayed which I always find to be a bit much. I think that, um, you know, maybe a couple times a year, maybe some organic granular material, but if there's a few weeds in the lawn, it really hasn't bothered me. But over the, over the years, people have tried many different ways to mow the lawn by hand. I know in India, for example, uh, when Indira Gandhi was uh, the president, uh, Everything had to be done by hand that could be. So lawns were, were often clipped with scissors. Um, can still do that in small areas today. Today we have string trimmers, of course, to do that. But people tried bicycles, they tried motorcycles. Harley Davidson made one with one of their engines. You know, there were big advertisements. Uh, you know, a lot of kids got a kick out of the mechanization because they didn't have to do it by hand anymore. And in the early, early days of the turn of the century, we had sheep on the front lawn of the White House. Uh, we had sheep's meadow in Central Park uh, that were the way to keep the, uh, the turf down. And uh, the estates in England, of course, used horse-drawn lawnmowers after they uh, had tried the earlier versions. But I think um, the, the horse-drawn uh, lawn was lawn mowing was pretty successful, and what they did is they actually made leather boots to put on the horses, and some had studs if there were hillier terrain or if it was a little bit wetter. And I actually have those in the collection as well. Edging the lawn was important. You had in the early days there were beautiful lawn edgers, long handles. Some had wheels, some didn't but um, there were versions then that became much more mechanized. They had wheels that would turn with sharp blades. Again, getting back to uh, just a wooden wheel, you know, that you could run along the edge. Um, and then the longer handled pieces that made it easier to operate along the, the various pathways. Daisy grubbers, um, amazing. I have daisy grubbers that are probably as small as six inches up to about five and a half feet long um, to get the really big guys out. But these were popular for a long, long time. Um, we turned them into something that looks more like this or even a little more of a, a pointed edge on the end, which you can still buy today. 
And again, getting back to uh, the late 1800s, early ransom lawnmowers probably started the mechanization of lawn mowing. And this happened uh, late 1800s. Today we have solar powered and electric lawn mowing. Um, we even have, uh, I think we've, we've kind of gotten there because we have over 5 million gas powered mowers are still sold in the US every year. We spill 17 million gallons of gasoline just trying to get it in the machine and we burn over 800 million gallons each year trimming our grass. So one hour of mowing is equal to about 350 miles of uh, driving in terms of uh, volatile organic compound release. So it's pretty destructive to the environment, just mowing the lawn. We're big on meadows. We try to reduce overall sizes of lawn as much as we can, including along our highways, um, but it's not always easy. Sweden has developed robotic lawn mowing, and uh, that may be a thing. We can robotically clean our pools. We can robotically uh, vacuum our houses, and now we can robotically mow our lawns. So I think that this says it the best, garden as though you will live forever. I'd like to thank everybody uh, this afternoon for inviting me to make this presentation. And uh, I hope we can safely uh, be outside gardening and, and gathering with friends in the very near future. Thanks very much.